I could have. Okay, we're back on the morning uh, brew for you today. Um, a real pleasure to, first of all, see Stephen J. Westman here today from Hello Local again. IQ Magazine. Um, and uh, a real pleasure to introduce to everyone Brian J. Jones. Brian is a local Albuquerque guy and author of, book, of the book uh, Jim Henson, The Biography. And welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Nice to be here. And uh, I, full disclosure, I had the chance to uh, chat with you yesterday. We recorded an interview for Canami right. PBS yesterday. We, I had a great time talking to yeah, you. Yeah, it was all Sesame Street. That was a lot of fun. It, it was <laughs> a lot of fun. Uh, great to have you. First, your, your Albuquerque credentials. Yeah, I, uh, I grew up here. I went to El Dorado High School. I actually went to Mitchell Elementary School and the University of New Mexico. Class of 85, El Dorado. Class of 89, UNM. Go Lobos. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, uh, we, we talked Muppets for a good half hour yesterday, and uh, we have a limited amount of time today. But Aaron, dive in. What do you want to know about the Muppets? Because Oh, my he knows. gosh. Where do I start? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'm just curious how, how you got connected with the Muppets. Do you have a history or a passion for the Muppets that kind of brought you to writing the book now? Yeah, I, I would say that I'm sort of Muppets Generation 1.0 because mm -hmm. I was two when Sesame Street came on the air. And I was nine when The Muppet Show came on the air. I saw The Muppet Movie in the theater. I saw Dark Crystal in the theater, which was a rarity, apparently. Um, so it was, he was one of those, I, I was aware of the Muppets, but I was also this really nerdy reader of credits as a kid. Mm -hmm. So I knew there were people that did these things. I knew those names at the end. Yeah. So I knew there was a Jim Henson and a Frank Oz. And so I had read uh, a couple books about him even as a kid. There's a great book called of Muppets and Men that I read until the cover fell off of it. Um, so I knew all about these guys. And after I'd finished my book on Washington Irving, uh, it was just sort of, uh, I was doing some research on him mm -hmm. and found it hadn't been done. Oh. So the rest is history. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, my, my, my townie calm is completely about Brian this week. You know, part of the whole Albuquerque connection and, and what you've done with the book. Um, yeah. And so it's been, it, it was one of my favorite things that I've written in the magazine. Now, the book is so thorough. I mean, it is, if you are a Muppets fan, it is the most uh, complete history of what Jim Henson and his cohorts, Frank Oz and everybody else did over the course of the years. Uh, we talked about this, we, we talked about how Henson is famous for Sesame Street, right. but he's also famous for outside of Sesame Street. Yeah, he, he could have been famous for The Muppet Show alone, yeah. or yeah. famous for The Fraggle Rock alone, or famous for you know yeah. Muppet Babies alone, but he, he did all that stuff in actually a very short amount of time when you think about it, too. Uh -huh. Yeah, he, he took 10 years to get The Muppet Show on TV. Yeah, that, was a, that, a, that was a real study in stick to just for Jim, because he knew that they were going to work. Uh, he had done enough variety shows on other people's shows, Jack Parr, Steve Allen, uh, Ed Sullivan, that he knew they could work on their own for half an hour. Uh, and couldn't convince the right people that it would work. Finally convinced Michael Eisner at ABC, who was an executive there in the 70s, to let him do a pilot. The first pilot he does doesn't really take hold. It's called The Muppets Valentine Show, which I will show footage of tonight at UNM. Um, and then he does another one called Muppet Show Sex and Violence, which he loved that name because he was sort of defying his kid show reputation. That one doesn't catch on either. Most people would have said, well, that's two and I'm done and it's not going to work. Right. He keeps going and he does this hilarious pitch reel to, for executives at CBS to convince them that this is going to work. It still didn't work, but he finally oh, found Lord Grey in, at Elstree in London for ATV who, who believed in Jim and gave him the money, but just said, you have to come and do this in London. And he did. That's for five years. Beautiful story. It's a great story. Yeah. I mean, I mean you know, most people would have given up, and he, he knew that was going to work, and he dogged it. Yeah. So he was obviously very ambitious, and he had a passion for this. I mean, what what really surprised you? Maybe that's something that you found out about Jim Henson while writing. The yeah, book. there's there was actually two things that really surprised me on this, and they were things you sort of had maybe uh, some idea of, but I wasn't really I didn't know the extent. At first, he was an extraordinarily good businessman. Um, he was successful early on. He was doing Muppets while he was in high school and college. Was, oh, wow. There's a picture right there of him painting. And he's about 20 uh, years oh, old there. Oh, how cool! Uh, that's the Kermit made from his mother's coat, <laughs> and he. Um, so he was actually successful early, but he had created Rolf the Dog for Purina Dog Shell commercials. And mm. somebody wanted to buy that character outright, and Jim's agent was excited about that because they were going to pay him $100,000, something astronomical in 1962. Oh and Jim told his agent, he said, never sell anything I own. He knew that his work had value, so when it came time to merchandising Sesame Street and Muppet Show, he already mm -hmm. he owned everything. Yeah. So, so, I mean, he was very astute there, great businessman. The second thing is I, he was almost pathologically conflict-averse. 
He wouldn't fight with his wife. He wouldn't, he wouldn't fight with his own attorneys. Uh, one of his producers said, Jim, you have to stop calling this a family because you cannot fire family. You have to call them, you know, coworkers or yeah. employees. And he could not do it. Wow. And there's, a, there's a, actually one of the stories I love in the book is he goes into the offices at Henson Associates and all the lawyers are kind of squabbling around. Right, there. right. And, they kind of, and Jim walks in and they sort of look to him to solve it. And he says, I, I got to go to London. And he gets on a plane <laughs> and goes to London, even though he doesn't have to go to London, just because, it, as his wife said, it was fight or flight and oh. he would choose flight every time. Mm. How was it talking to his wife and his kids about him? You know, they were all great. Lisa Henson, his oldest daughter, for example, has this really unique uh, ability to view her entire life in third person. I've never mm. seen anything like it. Huh. Um, his widow, Jane, uh, was incredibly open. She was the first person I actually interviewed. Mm. And I probably interviewed her for about 50 or 60 hours. And she died wow. uh, just earlier this year. Mm. Uh, so I think she was really glad to get a lot of that on there. Finally get it down and kind nice. of get her side of the story down. So she was very excited by very supportive of the project. What yeah. a gift, though. That yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and I got and Jerry Nelson, who did the Count and Snuffle Up, I guess. Oh, uh, he passed away cool. this year, uh, early this year as well. Oh. Oh and I, I got to talk to him in his house with me up in Truro, Massachusetts. A really, you know, really lovely guy. And you also got to talk a lot with Frank Oz, who yeah. was his collaborator for many years. And I love how the book opens. And it's the, the first chapter is called Blue Sky. And yeah. the, the co that's a code word. That was code on the set of Sesame Street, meaning a child was present on set, so you had to watch uh. your mouth. Uh, that wasn't really aimed at Jim. It was aimed more at Frank Oz. Uh, and when you, re when you read the book, uh, the F word is the coin of the realm for Frank Oz. And, uh, and it, it stayed in for the most part in there, which surprised me. But uh, his voice comes right off that page. He is very, very very funny even to this day uh, and still very um, you know very visibly moved thinking about Jim even now um, you reminded him it's been 23 years 23 years I think that math really was hard for him to do I don't think he'd realize that wow. uh, the last chapter of this book uh, if it doesn't make you cry uh, nothing will <laughs> because uh, and we won't give it away but it, uh, the, Jim Henson has some New Mexico roots yeah and it comes full circle in the last chapter. And yeah. can you talk about his his relation to the state? Sure. Um, Jim's father was a U.S. Department of Agriculture agronomist, and when he retired from working in uh, Mississippi and Maryland, they moved to Albuquerque in the early 1970s and lived up in the Northeast Heights, uh, right up around Eubank and uh, Spain. And I grew up at Eubank and Montgomery and didn't realize I was that close the entire time, which is really kind of spooky. Um, and th so they were there about 10 years. And actually, Jim loved the Southwest. He loved Albuquerque. He loved the balloon fiesta, would come out for the balloon fiesta a lot. And if you watch the opening credits of The Great Muppet Caper, that's actually in a hot air balloon. And uh -huh. they were hanging somebody off the bottom of another balloon, filming a balloon with the Muppets in it. But as you watch in the opening, as that balloon drops down, you'll see downtown Albuquerque for about a second oh. in the foreground on that as it comes down. Uh, so he actually filmed that opening sequence in New Mexico. That's huh. really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, he was, tr he was going to try to buy a ranch, maybe build a spa, some kind of resort up in Santa Fe. I mean, he loved it out here. So y'all both have this Albuquerque connection. Did y'all ever run into each other? <laughs> in any no, no. And, it, and Steve actually has a good story about his mother went to church with Jim's mom, and he used to... My father, oh. actually, yeah. Out, yeah. And we would run out of Sunday school hoping that Jim had come to church with his mom. Yeah. Oh my and, gosh. But we never saw him. I think I told lies as a kid that I did see him, but you know, <laughs> now I have to fess up and we didn't. But yeah, there was that, there was that cool connection there. Yeah. So. You were saying it wasn't prophetic, but Jim lost his, old, was it his, his older, older brother, older yeah, brother at older. a very young age. Yeah, his brother was in the Navy and was killed in a uh, car accident. And that profoundly affected him because he, he said, you know, we can't waste time. It's time to get things done because we're only here for a short time. Yeah, day. I think Jim came to realize that, you know, time was, you know, a very precious commodity. And I, th I think it's very interesting that the first film Jim made, he made a, a short film in 1964, 65 called Timepiece. And it's all about sort of an everyman racing against the clock, trying to get everything in in the day. And that, that was sort of reflective of Jim, especially at that time, a, a young man in a hurry, trying to figure out what and, he's going to be. And he died at 53. 53 years old, yeah. Now, you're speaking at UNM tonight? The UNM tonight, 6 o'clock, yeah. Um, I've got great video to show. I'll show you the Muppet Show pitch reel tonight, which is a hilarious piece of tape. I'll show you pieces of the Muppet Show pilots that didn't go anywhere. 
uh, some old commercials that haven't been seen in a long time. I'll show some footage of his memorial service, which uh, oh. is, is always a tough watch for people. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll see some Muppet Show sequences as well. So it should be a lot of fun. Should be a sweet evening. Yeah, yeah I nice. So. I can't I'm, wait. I'm going to try to keep it to less than two hours if I can. But uh, anyway, it should be it should be a good night. Oh, yeah. And you've done this talk before. We, you were you were at the Smithsonian, right? I was at the Smithsonian Tuesday uh -huh. night. It was a little bit different talk. Uh, the Smithsonian sort of sets the theme, and they said this will be more than Muppets. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that night, I, I talked a lot about you know films like timepiece and the cube and i'll show a little bit of the cube tonight but a lot of the sort of experimental stuff he did but people just loved it huh yeah and one of the stories i love about him at that time is he wanted to open an inflatable nightclub in the 1960s <laughs> and, I, and actually had footage that he had shot uh, oh to use goodness. in that nightclub yeah, well i th i think he's a, an icon yeah. uh, a genius and gone far too soon but this book will uh, make him live again, Jim Henson, the biography, and uh, I hope it goes well. To, is everybody invited to this at UNM? Tonight? Yeah, it's open to the public. It'll, it should be should be a, a big open event. So, you, can a, online, you can RSVP online. You can RSVP online, but even if you don't RSVP online, you can come anyway, and there'll be a nice reception afterwards. So it should, be, it should be fun. And real quick, when and where is it? Uh, it's 6 p.m. at Centennial Hall, uh, southwest corner of campus, the old, right. in the engineering building. Yeah. Very good. Perfect. Stephen Jay, thank you. Good to see you. Very excited about this one. Very Brian J. Jones, everybody, uh, author of Jim Henson, The Biography. It's the Morning Brew. We're rolling it out today. We'll be back in a moment.